Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a beautiful Chag Shavuot. And uh, you've all been so inspired by Matan Torah on Har Sinai that you're ready to come back for more Torah study bright and early on the day after Chag. So it's good to see everybody. Um, what we're going to be continuing in is first a few lines from the Kuzari, and then we'll go to our Parsha, or actually more correctly to our Haftorah for, for this Shabbos. Um, what I'd like to uh, take a look at is where we were holding. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, so. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just review from the very bottom of page 395. Um, we are in the fourth essay of the Kuzari um, in uh, large paragraph number three, small paragraph or subparagraph number nine. And what we're talking about are the different names of God. And in the context, of describing the different names of God, um, we are talking about the special name of Yudke Vavke, the Shem Havaya, or the Tetragrammaton. And um, this name is unique. It's a unique name that God only shares with the Jewish people via the prophetic experience, which as we know from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's Shit Shita, his uh, opinion, is that this only works for the Jewish people. Only the Jewish people can be privy to this prophetic experience to really have this face-to-face -face encounter with God. And in the course of describing this, he, he uses a, a poetic language. Um, he says, there can be no such connection between him and any idolatrous nation or any other, uh, any other uh, foreign nation um, even though that nation may call out to God and God may at some point be responsive to them, but this special relationship uh, of Yudke Vavke, this face-to-face -face revel rev revelatory experience is unique to the Jewish people. And this led him in the paragraph that we learned last time to review his position on chosenness. And for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, chosenness is, is a very real thing, that the Jewish people are not only chosen for the responsibility of doing the mitzvot of the Torah, but we also have an inherent um, quality within us that makes us different from the rest of the world. And uh, that difference is manifest in our ability to prophesy. That's something that no other nation uh, has the ability to do. Um, and therefore he writes, God bestows his light only upon the elite people. Just the, the, the Hebrew, even though this is written in Arabic originally, but the Hebrew is a, is a direct translation of it. Ki enenu otsel oro. God does not um, give forth his light except to ki im al hasigula the al ba'alei data amitit, except to the elite people and the possessors of the true religion. The Jewish people are the objects of this special chosenness, and this closeness is reciprocal. Thus, God is called the God of Israel, and they are called the nation of God and the nation of the God of Avraham. We are called, Elo God is called Elokei Israel. We are called Am Hashem and Am Elokei Avraham. Um, although we find that some nations did follow God and worshiped him after hearing of his wonders and accepting him, right? We have many examples of this. The people of Nineveh, for example, called out to God in the book of Yonah and God responded to them. However, where do we see that God ever accepted them, attached himself to them, desired their service or became angry when they rebelled? On the contrary, we see that the destiny of these nations, their welfare and detriment, are subject to nature and chance. Nothing that can be ascribed to an act of God occurs for them. We further see that God singled us out when he said, Hashem badad yanchenu, that God alone guided the nation. Ve'en imo 
El Mechar, and there is no strange God that accompanies this nation. You could ask from the people of Nineveh, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi seems to be overplaying his hand. He seems to be saying that seemingly only arbitrary events happen to other nations. What would he say about the people of Nineveh, where it says that they cried out to God and God averted his decree against them? Um, he probably would say what many other commentaries suggest is that Ninve was different because their, um, their uh, interaction with Hashem was directly due to the people of Israel. Because the people of Ninve had actually been chosen to be the, the source of retribution to B'nai Israel. So it could be that Ninve was a special case. So Rabbi Huda Halevi essentially says that there is a certain arbitrariness uh, in the way that um, things happen to the other nations. Whereas with God, he shines a direct light. This light, I wanna just focus on for just a second because we do find this idea of light as a sign of God being present or God being most manifest in his providence and what we would call hashkacha pratit, divine, unique providence, individual attention that God gives to the Jewish people more so than other nations. Uh, the Rambam talks about this also, even though ironically, the Rambam takes a very decidedly different approach to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi as to what the meaning of chosenness is. But certainly if we look at the Rambam's definition of the word shechina, he does, refer to it in terms of light. Um, just to look at the very last paragraph of this uh, chapter uh, 25 of the first section of the Guide for the Perplexed, the, the Rambam writes, and this is the Friedlander translation, which is available online. We, we, uh, the, the idea of the Rambam here is describing the verb shochen, shin chaf nun, which is um, a verb that occurs throughout Tanakh. And he says it is used in the context of people or um, inanimate objects, but it can also be employed to refer to Hashem. Um, um, everything which has settled and remains fixed on one object, although the object on which the thing remains is not a place and the thing itself is not a living being, you can also use the term shochen. For instance, let the cloud dwell upon it, the day. There is no doubt that the cloud is not a living being and that the day is not a corporeal thing, but a division of time. So you see the word shochen can be used figuratively, but it can also be referring to a physical resting. In this sense, the term is employed in reference to God, that is to say, to denote the continuance of his divine presence or of his providence in some place where the divine presence manifested itself constantly, or in some object which was constantly protected by providence. I don't think I'm sharing my screen, so I better do that now with the people out in TV land. There you go. Here I'm sharing my screen now. Sorry about that. So here we are in this last paragraph of Moren of Vuchim. In this sense, the term is employed in reference to God. In other words, the Rambam wants to say that God does not occupy a spatial lo location, but when we say that God rests his presence, it means that his providence is manifest, meaning that if you see something miraculous happening in a localized area, you say that God re is resting here, not that God himself is resting, but rather his Providence is manifest. The fact that he's interacting with the world is manifest in a certain place. Okay. In the Mishkan. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, compare and the glory of the Lord abode, which is again a reference to the to the Mishkan. Uh, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, the Shachanti Betoch Bene Israel, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. Um, which is uh, Deuteronomy 33. What is that? I forget the Pasuk offhand. Whenever the term is applied to the Almighty, it must be taken consistently with the context in the sense either as referring to the presence of his Shekhinah, 
the presence meaning that his providence is noted. And he says over here, i.e. of his light that was created for the purpose in a certain place or of the continuance of his providence protecting a certain object. So the Rambam equivocates at the very end of this chapter and he says that it is possible for God to create a certain kind of light or ethereal physical item that is representative of the fact that he uh, is affecting a certain place more than other places in the world. So the word Shekhinah can mean a created object that God creates like a cloud or some kind of light that uh, delineates to mankind that God is doing something special in a certain place, but it's not God himself. Or it can just be referring to a detectable providence um, in a certain place because a miracle is taking place. It can, it can refer to either one of those two things. So for the Rambam, um, Shekhinah means either a created cloud or light, or it's just an idea in, in, in the abstract to denote that God is more noticeable, his providence is more noticeable in one place than in it. That's how the Rambam defines the word Shekhinah. But the, his use of the word light in this idea is something that we could make note of that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is, is stating over here as well. What he's suggesting is, is that God uniquely shines this light of providence upon the Jewish people more so than on other nations. And it's clear that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is referring to pro divine providence here, what we would call hashkacha pratit, or individual attention that God places upon the Jewish people more so than on other nations. And that's the reason why the name, the four letter name, the Tetragrammaton is applied to the Jewish people because it's descriptive of a special kind of, of uh, attention that God places upon us more than on any other nation. Now it's important to note that even though we find this commonality between the Rambam and Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, let's not be confused to think that the Rambam agrees with Rabbi Yehuda Halevi that the Jewish people and the Jewish people alone can be privy to that kind of providence. The Rambam is of the opinion that any people or persons who are holy can receive divine providence in this way. Um, so, but that's another subject that's not for now. But what I did want to point out is that this idea of light or the shining of a light being the terminology that we find in the Kuzari for divine providence and finding it as well in the Morena um, is something that um, is noted by some of the Meforshim. And there's a very interesting commentary of the Noda Yehuda, Rabbi Yechesko Landau, who was a halachic decisor and was the Rav of, um, of, of Prague and presided over the Council of the Four Lands in the 18th century. In other words, he was one of the Gedole Hador in the 18th century. And he has a response on talking about whether or not a person should recite a certain formula before making a bracha. It's l'shem yichud kudsha b'richu. I'm not sure if that, if those words um, are familiar to you, but they are found in some sidurim. And there was a, a, the Hasidic movement was on the rise during the lifetime of Rabbi Yechezka Landau. And there were many questions that came up because in Hasidus, there was a, an emphasis on the mystical aspects of doing mitzvot, and they would recite these um, formulae before making a bracha and before doing a mitzvah, and it raised a lot of controversy, whether or not it's appropriate to do so. But, in the, but that's just the side issue, just to provide this with context. In the context of that discussion, he wants to point out um, that uh, he wants to explain what the word Shekhinah means. Because in that formula, it says, ushechinte, for the sake of the unification of the Holy One, blessed be he, and his Shekhinah. 
So he says, what does it mean? You want to unify God and his Shekhinah. Is there a duality to God? Is there some, what's the difference between God and his Shekhinah? So in the context of that discussion, Rav Landau quotes the Mora Nevuchim, notes that the Rambam has two different opinions as to what the word Shekhinah means, two possibilities. It can either be a created light or cloud, some ethereal essence of, that's part of the physical realm, which is representative of God, or it could mean just in general, God's providence that is noted in a certain place because of some miraculous phenomenon that occurs in that place. So he says as follows, so I take out of the Rambam that it means one of those two things, either a created light or divine providence. But I say that really they converge onto the same thing ultimately, because he says that God's providence is not something that's completely non-substantial. I'm not sure exactly what he means, but he says that divine providence that emanates from God is in itself a light. That's or ne'etzal mimena or hagadol. Um, and that's what, it, there's this great light that emanates from God. And I don't know what he means. The Rambam clearly indicated that if man can detect a light or some kind of physical manifestation of God, then that's a created item. But Rav Landau wants to say that that in itself is light. God's providence is light. And perhaps he's referring to an immaterial light, a light that is not something that we detect with our senses, but is a, a transcendent light. And here, the note of Yehuda, Rav Landau, becomes very Halevian in his approach to the particularization of the Jewish people as being privy to this divine light and only the Jewish people. He says, it is according to God's will, and when the Jewish people are fulfilling God's will, as Iker Hashkachatobi Yisrael, then God's primary focus, his providence, as it were, is upon Israel. Vilahem Mashpia Kol Shefato, and God um, emanates all goodly emanation upon the Jewish people. Ella shemachmat ribui hatova magia gamkein lemekomot acherim, and it is a result of this emanation um, showering down upon the Jewish people that goodness emanates throughout the world. So the way that Rav Yecheskelando understands the uniqueness or the chosenness of the Jewish people is that we, as the, the nation, create a conduit for God's providence to 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 uh, go out into the rest of the world. So we receive divine providence, and if we are worthy of receiving a goodly emanation from Hashem, then it is through us. We sort of funnel all of that emanation out into the rest of the world. And this is explicit in a pasuk in Bechukosai that we just read a couple of weeks ago. Ufaniti alechem. God says, if you follow in my ways, I will face you. Upeirish Rashi, efnemi kol asakai l'shalem scharchem. But the word ufaniti doesn't just mean I will face you, but lefanot is to push aside, right? Lefanot is to, is to clear away which basically God says, I will clear my schedule. I'll clear my calendar in order to focus just upon giving you your reward. So we see therefore that there's this unique focus upon the Jewish people. In Parshas Ekev, in talking about the promised land, the land of the Jewish people, it says, 
This is a land that God uniquely seeks it out. Upiresh Rashi, the halo kol ha'aratso to doresh v'chulei. Doesn't God seek out every place in the world? Ela kiviachol eno doresh ela ota. That Rashi explains that really God focuses his attention on Eretz Yisrael. Ba'al yedei ota derisha shadoresh ota doresh kol ha'aratzot. And it is through God's focus upon the land of Israel that all other lands receive an emanation, a funneling through the land of Israel that spreads out to the rest of the world. Shesham hu makom hatmadat hashkacha, because Eretz Yisrael has divine providence with constancy, and the rest of the world receives sort of the byproduct of that constant emanation. Ayin Sham Barashi, I refer you to that Rashi. Bezehu haperu shahashchina shora Yisrael. And that's really what it means when we say that the divine presence rests upon Israel. Shahashkacha shakruya shechina hurak Yisrael. This is the epitome of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. That this divine providence, which the Rambam calls shechina, is unique to the Jewish people. The Rambam doesn't say that. He doesn't say that it's unique to the Jewish people. But Rabbi Yechezkel Landau says it because he's clearly following the tradition that is promulgated by Rabbi Yehuda Halei. The Cholze, now listen to the, and then here is the kicker. After having said that anything that happens to the world is because of the Jews, and anything that, and, and all divine emanation that goes to the rest of the world goes through the land of Eretz Yisrael, he says, V'cholze keshe Yisrael osim ritzono, but that's only when the Jewish people fulfill God's will. Aval bihit gabrut chata'inu ufishainu, but when there is a preponderance of sin within the Jewish people, and when we don't fulfill God's will, galinu me'artzainu, we are exiled from our land. Shesham hu makom hatmadat ha'ashkacha v'galinu la'artzot ha'amim, that if we're not fulfilling Hashem's word, we are exiled from our land, which is the place of constant providence, because God says, you don't, I, I can't focus my attention on you if you're just going to be insulting and offending me constantly. So therefore, leave Eretz Yisrael, go to the lands of the other nations. Ve'az nahafochu. And then when the Jews are in Galus, everything is the opposite. Shekol hashefa hatov yored l'umot ha'olam that divine providence then emanates and falls upon the other nations. Umin ha-tamtzit anu mekabli me'oto ha-uma kidei chiyutenu b'tzimtzum. And as a result of our living among those other nations, we receive divine emanation as a byproduct of the emanation on the other nations, which is pretty dramatic if you think about it. What he's essentially saying is, when we're doing good, then the hashkacha, God's shechina rests upon us, and we act as the conduit to spread it out to the rest of the world. When we're in gullus, because we haven't been following Hashem's wor word, then it's not just that we no longer are privy to that special divine providence, but actually we're less than the other nations. The other nations receive emanation directly, not via Israel, and we as Israel, because we're um, an exiled nation and we don't really belong in those places, we receive our divine providence just through the conduit of those other nations. So we're the secondary receivers when we're in Gullus. When we're in Eretz Israel, we're the primary receivers and the whole world are the secondary recipients. When we're in Gullus, the other nations are the primary recipients and we receive as a byproduct of their receivership. Okay? Yeah. The land. They're they're what they're 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 um they're interrelated. Not interchangeable, but the, but they're interrelatable. In other words, yes, of course, but it's Eretz, but uh, remember Rabbi Huda Levi says this throughout Kuzari as well. 
the special nature of the Jewish people can only be fulfilled in Eretz Yisrael. Prophecy can only happen in the land of Israel, if you recall from earlier sections in the Kuzari. That's why in section two, so much time was devoted to the special quality of Eretz Yisrael, right? So the two are related. It's, if you recall the analogy, I think he's gonna come back to it in section four. I don't remember. I now have to go back and remember where we saw it, but he compares, it, it, is, it is an essay for, he compares the specialness of the Jewish people to a chosen vine. Remember that analogy? And if you take a vine and you plant it out in the desert, no matter, you know, that vine could have been cultivated in the Champagne region of France, right? That could have been the finest vine, right? But if you plant it in a desert, it's not going to grow very well. You need a combination of both the best quality vine that's been genetically uh, through horticulture has been cultivated to be to produce the finest grape, but then you also need to plant it in the right soil. So the Jewish people are the vine, and Eretz Israel is the proper soil. One without the other will not work. So he's saying that they're interrelated. You, you, um, Shechina comes only to the Jewish people when we are in Eretz Israel. Once we're sent out into the Gullus, so we're like the vine, the, 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 the genetically uh, um, uh, superior vine, but we're out in the desert. So we're not gonna grow. And if anything, all of our nourishment comes via the other nations, all of our spiritual nourishment. So you say that, the that is correct. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah, because at the time of Matan Torah, there's a divine revelation, right? So this is all post Sinai after we enter into the land and we, we possess the land of Israel, right? So, um, so when Rabbi Yehuda Halevi talks about the, the reason why I, I raised this all is because Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is talking about this idea of chosenness, and he uses this, this terminology of atzilat oro, of an emanation of God's light. And it's, um, it's, it's curious that the Rambam, who writes after Rebbe, the Kuzari is published in 1140, the Rambam writes the Moren of Uchim in the late 12th century, about 50 years after the publication of the Kuzari, maybe 40, 40 to 50 years after the Kuzari is written. Rabbi, uh, the Rambam never makes explicit mention of the Kuzari, but that's not surprising. He still may have had access to it. Um, but what we do see is that uh, there's this idea of Shechina being described as a divine light. And Rav, uh, Rav Landau says that you can take the two of them instead of using the Rambam's bifurcated definition of being one, a created light and two, divine providence. He says, put them together. This divine light is divine providence in and of itself. And the, that's what is meant by divine light. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to show you for today. Um, again, um, this is a very, um, it's a very important discussion, but it is important also to note that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's definition of chosenness is, um, is a, particular, a particularized chosenness, chosenness. There's something innate within the Jewish people when we're in Eretz Yisrael that makes us different from the rest of the world. We are privy to something that the rest of the world cannot possibly receive. This is problematic for many people who um, it offends their sensibilities because it suggests that there are innate differences between Jews and non-Jews, but it should not be, by now, at this point in our studies, we should not be shocked by this kind of theology from Rabbi Yehuda Levi. We've seen it throughout, okay? Yes, there are those who say that, yes. 
uh, Mrs. Sachachevsky is asking, does anyone discuss the idea that the Jews are treated differently from the other nations, even when we're in Gullus, even when we're in the diaspora? And the answer is yes, of course. But it's an interesting perspective that we get from Rav Yechezkel Landau. Remember, he is, this is a part of a polemic that he's writing against this whole idea of reciting a formula of God and his Shekhinah. He doesn't feel that it's appropriate to anthropomorphize uh, the Shekhinah in the way that it's being done as an introduction to uh, performance of the mitzvah. It could bring some uh, thoughts of, that are akin to idolatry, to anthropomorphizing God and so forth. And, uh, and he's, not, he's not really so keen on that. And that was really what was being was taking place in his time. There were the theological threats that were perceived to being brought by um, in, in Hasidus, and uh, and that's what he was sort of railing against. And so, therefore, he takes a very a much more theological approach, um, which is more in the abstract of what the idea of Shechina is, and that's what he wanted to point out. Yes, Linda, go ahead. Um, you're you're muted, so we can't hear you if you're trying to speak. Hi, sorry. Um, I, so, how can he say that the wall of the Jews outside of Israel is just like all the other nations? Because if that's true, what does that really say about the role of Jews in terms of influencing other nations? And you know what we've always thought as being a light into the nation and having a specific role different than the non than the non Jews. Right. He, yeah. So so just like everybody you know, else. You know, he he's um uh, your your question is a valid question, but let's just let's just be clear. He didn't talk about the role of the Jews. He talked about the uh, divine providence that the Jewish people are privy to or are the the beneficiaries of. Oh, and what we mean by divine providence is special attention by God to reward us and to come to our aid when we need him. Um, and that, he says, does not happen when we are in the diaspora. We are also, just like the other nations, can get uh, bumped around from, from time to time in a seemingly arbitrary way. The Jewish people uh, will, will have those same kinds of arbitrary kinds of experiences. That's all that we've seen from Rev Landau. He's, he hasn't commented at all on the role that we play. And presumably the role that we play in the Galus is even more um, uh, pressing upon us to be to act as a light unto the nations. And that we have an, a responsibility to live virtuously in the presence of the other nations. Even though we won't be receiving or we won't be seeing the, uh, right, right. The, even though, know, even though we, won't, we won't be privy to that special divine providence that mm -hmm. God promises to us in the Torah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. so with that, let's, uh, let's put a close to the study of the Kuzari for today. And I wanted to speak to you about the Haftorah that we're going to read about uh, this Shabbos. Normally we look at the Parsha, but I figured um, let's look at the Haftorah because we haven't looked at uh, this Haftorah yet to my, to my recollection in this shir. We read about the birth of Shimshon, who lives during a very tumultuous period in Jewish history from the book of Shoftim, which is the early history of the Jewish people of the first couple of centuries after we've um, settled the land. Um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a period of lawlessness. There's no king. Um, there are instead shoftim, who are, the word is translated as judges. They don't have monarchical authority, but they are sort of like the religious figure as well as the political figure that leads the Jewish people. Um, and the shoftim were by all measures, imperfect beings, because we were in the process of evolving into the nation that we were destined to become. We were not perfect. We were not in our perfected state when we came into Eretz Israel. We were still a very flawed people. 
And that flaw, those flaws were manifest in our leaders as well. So with that in mind, you know, you read many stories in Sefer Shoftim about flawed leaders who strove for greatness and possessed great holiness, but yet were still flawed in, in one respect or another. Um, it is in this context that we are told about the birth of Shimshon. And the reason why we read about it in the Haftorah for the Shabbos is because we're going to read about the Nazir. And uh, Shimshon was a Nazir from the time that he was born, actually even before he was born. Uh, the angel that came to Manoach and Mrs. Manoach were told that even while you're pregnant with this child, you cannot have you must abstain from all wine and grape products because this child will be a Nazir even before he's born and remain that way throughout his life. There was something in that command that tells us that this future child was going to be a person of great potential, but also needed to be restrained in some way because if he wasn't restrained with Nazarism, he was going to be unleashed into the world without having that necessary, those necessary restraints. And if he didn't have those restraints, he could have been lost permanently to the world. Because the world has certain um, allures to it so that people even with great potential can fail and fall from grace because they have that weakness and ultimately, we do read about this in the story of Shimshon, is that he, he demonstrated greatness, and despite his Nazarism, he had certain moral failings, okay? But it was the Nazarism, it was foretold to them that this was going to be Shimshon's quality, and you had to, you, the parents, therefore, had to be careful, raise him, and guide him knowing that he was going to have certain predilections that were going to make him more prone to failure at the very same time that he was prone to great success. And it raises the question, why does God create people that way? We don't know. We can't, we're not going to answer that question right now. But we do know that sometimes people with great potentials for greatness end up crashing and burning and failing. We've seen this many times in, 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 in heroic figures within the Jewish people. I don't have to go over some of the sordid headlines that have appeared recently within, within our people, that it's sometimes the people with the greatest potential end up uh, becoming the villains of the story instead of the heroes of the story. And it's very, you know, it's a very sobering thought. So uh, we'll start from a, with a Pasuk that is not from our Parsha, but is from Parsha Bahalotcha, next week's Parsha. Uh, so maybe this will even be beneficial for people who are in Eretz Yisrael and reading Baalot Um The Torah talks about the, in, the way that the Jews traveled through the desert. They traveled, uh, each tribe walking through the desert with its tribe. And the Torah describes how the tribe of Dan was always in the back. That the, the camp of Dan always was the me'asef, the gatherer in, um, the one who gathered everyone in. What does that word, what does that term mean, that they were the me'asef? It's translated as the one who, uh, what is it called, carried the rear? Is that what you say? Um, brought up the rear. Brought up the rear. Yeah. And Rashi says, Ma'asef l'chol ha-machanot, Talmud Yerushalmi, l'fi shahaya shito sheldan merube be'ochlosin, haya nosea ba'acharona. Because the tribe of Dan had such a large tribe, it was a very large tribe, which is ironic because there was only one son to Dan, but he had a huge family. Um, uh, they, because they were so big, they spread out across the entire width of the encampment in the back, and they would like sort of sweep up anything that was left behind. The Chomisha Hayam Ma'ave Davar Hayam Machzirolo. 
So they would, if you lost something, if you drop something on the road, the people of Dan would find it, they'd pick it up. And you knew that if you lost, you know, your favorite uh, turban or whatever it was, you know, you could always go back to the tribe of Dan once we came to a rest and someone from Dan had a lost and found and uh, you, would, you would get it from them. But ochlosin is that uh, it's, it's a, I think it's a Greek word actually. It just means in their multitudinous. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's and it's and it's large in its largeness, and it's just a very large population. Now, uh, the Nitziv in his Ha'amek Davar writes, "Ma'asef l'chol hamachanot l'tzivotam mi shenecheshal v'lo yachol alechet im machanehu." That it doesn't just mean that they gathered. Uh, inanimate lost objects, but what if someone became a straggler and they just they had they, the person was weak and wasn't able to keep up with the rest of the of his tribe when they were traveling, the hayan yishar yichidi achoreha machane, and they were left behind. So neesaf lemachane b'nei dan, the encampment of dan would would pick them up. Umachane b'nei dan hayu holchim laat. They would travel a little bit more slowly. And when it was time to stop, you know, the Danites, the Dan camp always got there last, picked up all the stragglers, and they would deliver the stragglers back to their encampment once they got to their place of resting, let's say at the end of the day or when, wherever it was when they were resting. So this is the role of the tribe of Dan. Now, how does this relate to Shimshon? Shimshon is from the tribe of Dan. And the prophecy that the angel gave to Manoach and his wife is, Ki ravi bein. he speaks to Mrs. Manoach, and he says, you're going to become, to conceive and have a child. Umoralo ya'ale al rosho, let not a razor go over his head. Ki nazir elokim min habatan, because he will be a Nazarite even from when he's in the uterus. He will begin to save the Jewish people from the hands of the plishtim. Clearly you see that the Jewish people, even before Shimshon was born, were being harassed by the Philistines, um, who ironically are not an indigenous people of the Middle East, it's a side issue, but nonetheless, they were a thorn in the side of the Jewish people. And Shimshon, the angel says, will be the beginner of the salvation from the Philistines. I want to share with you just a paragraph from a longer essay from Rav Dessler in his Mikhtav Meliyahu. And it, comes, it becomes clear to me after comparing what Rav Dessler writes with what Rav Sadok Akohin Milublin writes, who lives a generation before Rav Dessler, that Rav Dessler is basing many of his writings on the writings of Rav Tzadok Milublin, who is um, a, um, a Litvak turned Chassid, who became a Chassid after having learned with the Rebbe of Ishpitz, Rabbi Mordechai Leiner. So Rav Dessler writes as follows. Barur, kirak me'atim ka'ila yotzimen ha'klal hayu b'shevetan. Now, first of all, what he's referring to over here is the fact that Shevet Dan are referred to the stragglers themselves. Why? Because there were some people from the tribe of Dan who got left behind by the cloud of glory. And Chazal say, the Medrash says that one of the people of Dan was traveling with an, an idolatrous statue. And so you see that there was something there was something askew, something awry with the tribe of Dun. On the one hand, they were foretold by Yaakov Avinu that they were the source of future salvation. Hashem is what Yaakov says when he gives a blessing to the tribe of Dun. That Dan will be a great, fierce warrior who will be able to defeat his enemies. And I, I strive 
and hope for your salvation when I look at Dan. Dan has that incredible potential for holiness, but there are also some elements within Dan that represent a removal from holiness. So he says, Hashavet atzmo adaraba, ne'emar alav ma'asef l'chol hamachanot. But the tribe itself is the gatherer of the other camps. Shahaya oseik bahachzarat haniflatim el tachat kanfei he'anan. It doesn't just mean a physical straggler. The trait of Shevet Dan was the uncanny ability to go out and work with someone who was spiritually weak and was having a, a crisis of faith, perhaps, and to bring that person and restore them to their faith and bring them back to the cloud. And it's important for us to think of this, especially in the context of all of the outreach that people are, are doing today uh, and have been doing for years, is that what Dan represents is in a movement of, of helping those who are the straggling Jews, the struggling Jews of their generation, to help those people find their way back. Lahaviyam el madregat ota kedusha harama, to bring them back to a lofty level of holiness. Benemar b'shevet dan b'birkat Moshe Rabbeinu alav hashalom, dan gur arye, that Moshe, before his death in, in Parshas uh, Bezos Habracha, says about Dan that they are a, 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 a lion cub. Mamash kevirkat Yaakov avinu alav hashalom li Yehuda. This was exactly the same term that Yaakov uses to describe Judah. So Moshe describes Dan in the same way that Yaakov describes Yehuda as a lion cub, a powerful leader. When Yaakov was blessing Dan, he genuinely believed that the Messiah would come from Dan and not from Yehuda. Until, that was a temporary thought, he was able to see more clearly prophetically after a while, and then realized that a messianic figure will come from Dan, namely Shimshon, but then will ultimately fail, fall, and the Messiah will come from a different tribe. davar amok. And what we see from here is a very deep idea. That because Dan had a certain aspect of being compromised, of being lower in certain respects, of being sort of with the stragglers in the back, and had that aspect of sometimes members of the tribe of Dan were themselves outside the cloud, it was that very quality that enabled them to connect with other stragglers and bring them back into the cloud. As we know, and as we know, that in order for a tzaddik to help someone who's lost and has been pulled away from holiness, that tzaddik sometimes also needs to detach himself from holiness in order to connect with those who need that help. In other words, if you're such a gross tzaddik and you're up in your ivory tower of holiness, then how are you possibly going to connect with the stragglers, with the people who are struggling? If you have no knowledge of what's going on in the world, and you don't connect to people who are interested in People Magazine, right? Then how are you going to be able to connect to them in order to be able to enrich their lives? Because you're not speaking the same language, you're not able to communicate. A person who wishes to help people come back needs to communicate with them in their, in their own language. Ach me'idach gisa, hare yesh baze sakana gedola lemi she'enenunaki. But it also comes along with it, its own occupational hazard. Because if you're not really clean spiritually, 
and you try to go out into that world of impurity to help with the stragglers, you may become one of the straggled instead of the bringer up of the straggler. And that's how we understand the greatness of the tribe of Dan. God assigned Dan with that role. Be the me'asef, be the gatherer in of the stragglers. Um, and, um, and he says in the parentheses, we find this idea existing with Yehoshua as well. That when, when Yehoshua went to battle with Amalek, Moshe Rabbeinu says, say, ilachem ba'amalek, go out and fight Amalek. In other words, in order to battle Amalek, you have to leave the inner sanctum of holiness. Because in order to, to defeat Amalek, you have to connect with them on some level. And you can only do that when you're prepared to leave the inner sanctum of holiness. Now, Reb Tzadok, really continues this idea. And I believe this is where Rav Dessler got this from. He says, This is really Shimshon. Shimshon embodies the tribe of Dan, of Dan in the sense that he is a descendant of Dan. And he has this great, amazing strength not only physical, but it's, it manifests itself in the physical, but it, it comes from a spiritual energy that he had that was greater than any other Jew. He says, and clearly, if the scripture calls him a gibor, a mighty warrior, it's not just talking about his physical prowess, but it's talking about his ability to conquer his evil inclination. Right? And that was really an innate part of him that he was born with. The Alkain Hayan Nazir Elohim in Habetan. That's why God wanted him to be a Nazir, to uh, foster that great Givura, that great strength, that great ability to, to conquer one's own inner demons. The gidul hasearot biktusha kinazir, and also the growing long of the hair as a nazir. The nikra kadoshu amorehit kabrut hakvurot hakadoshoch al son a Yisrael. And this would enable Shimshon, this ability to, um, to not tamper with his, his inner strength by becoming a nazir or by being a nazir from the time he was born, would give him that. Uh, would, would foster that great strength to defeat the enemies of Israel. And he, again, descended from the tribe of Dan, who was called the lion cub, who has this innate uh, inner strength that is not just an add-on, but is innate to the tribe of Dan. And that's why Shimshon genuinely believed that he would succeed not only in defeating the Philistines, but in eradicating evil from his society completely. He says that, that there would be some kind of complete separation um, between the holiness of the Jewish people and you know, a complete separation from the other nations. So that even though the other nations would always be around, but he, Shimshon was hoping for this great separation, this great distillation of the Jewish people through his efforts at separating the Philistines from the Jews. This was the power of the tribe of Dan. Not only did they return lost objects, they returned lost people to their source. Even though Dan was considered in certain respects the lowest of the tribes, 
and which uh, and sometimes members of Dan were ejected by the cloud. But it was, and as Rav Dessler explains, based upon the teachings of Rav Tzadok, it was precisely their ability to be on that cusp of holiness that enabled Shimshon to engage with the Philistines in the hope of completely defeating them and separating the Jews from them. He failed as, a, as, a, as the typical as the archetypical tragic hero in that he, he eventually succumbed due to, to, to his own hubris, to, the, uh, to his own belief of his own greatness. And as a result, did not adequately prepare for the pitfalls of what he was doing and eventually succumbed to the guiles of, uh, of his own desires, you know, of the women that were around him, especially, especially Delilah. So, in any event, um, this is an important idea. When anyone is engaged in what we call Kiruv today, when you're engaged in trying to do outreach to others, what you're doing is a virtuous act. And you have to remember that you're doing God's work. You're doing the work of the tribe of Dan to bring people back into the fold. There, is there an occupational hazard? Undoubtedly so. You have to not be confident in your own strength, but have to always sort of double back and get back into the cloud yourself from time to time before you run out again and try to and try to help all of the other all of the other people who uh, would be outside of that cloud. But bring them back. Don't be deterred by the occupational hazard. Just be aware of it, and that I think is the lesson of um, Shimshon. Uh, who, whose objective was holy, was emblematic of the entire tribe. And we can learn from his failure, from his mistake, how to behave when we want to be Shimshon-like for ourselves and others in the future. Questions, comments? Yes, Karen, go ahead. Do you think I have to praise God? Because I'm not remembering the story correctly. I never really saw him as being going out to do anything to bring Jewish people into their voluntarism, you know, how we would phrase it. What did he do? What, how weird is it about getting the textual information to put him into this brief? All I see is like wife number one, parents, can you go back me that way? You know, wife number two, like, like go burn in some fields, but I, I don't see where he's coming from. Well, I mean, the, the whole story in, in its totality is Shimshon as the uh, ruler of the Jewish people facing up to the constant um, belligerence of the Philistines, right? I mean, that's really the, that's the overarching story. He has vices, there's no question that he's got this weakness for pretty women and he indulges that vice, but his overarching objective is to uh, stop the Philistines from attacking and bothering the Jews, right? Yeah, I mean, it is. That's the whole story. That's the overarching story. And that's why, and the Philistines truly are fearful of him. He instills fear into the hearts of the Philistines and the Jewish people live in relative peace for many years during his reign because he scares off the, the Philistine attack. But how is he able, but also he's able to make peace with them through engagement with them as well. He makes a peace treaty with them. He, uh, he gets involved with uh, a Philistine woman to show that he's one of the guys, right? And so, so that's, that's the way that he's able to be successful is leaving the cloud uh, in order to preserve the holiness for the rest of the camp. Time for another question. Yes, uh, Mrs. Sochachevsky is uh, uh, asking her question, and then we'll come to you in just a sec. Um, somebody, that if someone goes out to do and they and their children are exposed to stuff. 
yeah. people who aren't like them, then mm -hmm. the kids will still turn out okay because they're engaged in that mix of heroes. Yeah. But I, I heard it in the name of Rev. Aaron Cutler, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Um, but I haven't seen that to be borne out in reality. I see that, unfortunately, people who do go out to do care, sometimes their kids turn out not the way they wanted them to because they were exposed to. That's, I mean, that's a legitimate point. Um, sometimes people who go out to do care of their kids end up turning out not as, uh, uh, not as we, not as the parents might have wanted them to, because they may be negatively influenced by the various elements that people in Kirov get involved with. Um, all I can tell, I can only speak from personal experience. I don't think any one of my children ever suffered, um, and it only were only enriched by the crazy Shabbos tables we used to have when we were living out in the hinterlands. And, um, and even to this day, my children see some of the um, efforts that we do in outreach, not just to unaffiliated Jews, but also to, no, no, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about crazy Orthodox Jews. I'm talking about, um, you know, just some very, very different ways of people living their lives and different values and very, very secular uh, in their outlook on life. Um, and um, I don't think any one of my children uh, uh, suffered in, in, in any way spiritually, I think, uh, but it all depends. It all depends on what your, what your expectations are. If you're expecting your child to become the next Rosh Hashiva of Lakewood, then you probably should not go into Kirov because you want that kind of, of, of a uh, prodigious scholar that you're hoping to raise needs to be in a sheltered environment. So don't, if, you, if your goal for your children is to be, have them become, um, become a great who are going to be, uh, you know, part of an, a very secluded yes, community. Updated all my, uh... You don't want to put them out into that, into that world. Oh. So anyway, did any did someone else want to ask a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a question. Lane. So the story, I'll be back next week. Um, the story of uh, Shimshon is confusing because when he married his first uh, Philistine wife, the parents said, you know, why are you, you know, marrying her? And it said they didn't know that it was uh, Hashem's plan for him to marry. So I think he was just trying I guess it's like he was trying to infiltrate the uh, Philistines and get on the inside so he could uh, do something. I, yeah, as you said, make peace. Um, yep. And uh, for them to be afraid of him. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Go back and read the story if you want to. Let us, after you've gone through the story, I say that to Karen or anyone else who's interested, let us know if this still rings true. And if you have problems with it, come back to us. Okay. okay. Anyway, we're, we're over time. Everyone have a great day. Good to see you all. A good Isru Chag. And, um, and we'll, we'll still meet next week, Bezrat Hashem. But next week, I'm thinking either next week or the following week will probably be our last for the summer. And then we'll take a little break. Okay. okay. Thank right. you. Have a wonderful day. everybody. You too. Bye. Thank you.